You're listening to Tristeropod episode 3. I'm David Colma, the other guy is Dorian Wallace, and we're composers who apparently talk about politics and music. By the way, we're left-wing people. I haven't said that at the front of one of these things yet. So, leftists, that's us. Yeah. Dorian, go and ahead and talk say, about something. <laughs> when we say leftist, we mean uh, we mean sort of you know in in the left libertarian or uh, anarcho socialist uh, side of the spectrum. I would say you know Noam Chomsky esque uh, in in a lot of the ways that that we see the world. Um, you know, so for those of you that don't know who Chomsky is, yeah, yeah, go yeah. check him out. <laughs> yes, we don't like Stalin. Yes, we yeah exactly. Yeah. So um, I was thinking, uh, you know, last week we had left off uh, chatting about the book um, that you were reading, um, which uh, it's uh, it's talking music. It's written by William Duckworth, um, and and I, I I don't know the book. This is something you're reading, but um, I know the composers. Can you give a little bit about what this book's about, and we can start from there? Sure. The um... So William Duckworth wanted to write. He, so William Duckworth was a composer. He taught for the longest time at Bucknell University in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's dead now. Um, he um, wanted to write a book about the way all the different kinds of music notation that happened in the 1960s among Amer- experimental composers who were basically inventing their own new, t- new notations to make different kinds of music happen because the standard notation wouldn't have done what they wanted it to do. So talking about like John Cage and the experimental fluxus composers and stuff like that. And, um, but it, it was a broader project and he, he learned, he figured out through having conversations with these people that they were ending up talking about so many more other things that it was basically that he needed to be interviewing them about just music in general. Um, and he apparently interviewed a bunch of people. He said that the introduction mentions something like 50 interviews. And I think they're all separate individual people. And so the first volume, because I think there's a Talking Music 2. The first one came out in the 90s, mid-90s. And in, 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 um, it's basically just a who's who of people Dorian and I care about. Um, like John <laughs> Cage and uh, Colin Nankaro and... Uh, ben Johnston and Lamont Young and Steve Reichfeld Glass, Meredith Monk, Laurie Anderson. Uh, there's an interview with Blue in here, Blue Jean Tierney, uh, John Zorn. Just there are a bunch of other people, but um, <clears throat> but I've just been reading through it, and I've, one of the things I've noticed through some of the interviews is just it, uh, just how much they're sort of anytime the sort of politics comes up as they're talking about their music how much it sort of aligns with what Dorian and I have sort of come to over the past 10 years as uh, musicians being fucked over by the system. Um, and it's just, well, obviously Cage was some form of anarchist, right? You, Dorian, uh, Dorian loves to use his, uh, what's, is, is there actually a title? Untitled, this, un- untitled un- Anarchist Poem. <laughs> right, the title is Untitled Anarchist Poem. Um, I've literally yeah. read that poem before Dorian has played some of his music before, and he does it himself most of the time. I've um, had but, robots yeah. read that poem. I've had choirs read that poem. Right, no, that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, so lots, anyway. of, lots of cool shit. Uh, we'll we'll put that in the show notes. The the un, untitled anarchist poem. Do you want to read it right now? Um. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I pull, can it, pull up. it up. Let me ta- uh, let me but... keep talking. Just I'll. Yeah. 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 Um, then. Um, you know, Nankara, I mentioned at the end of the last time, has also got into democratic socialism. He was, he, you know, he went to the, I mean, he was so um, leftist that he went and uh, volunteered for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and fought in Spain in order to protect the, uh, you know, the uh, Spanish Revolution, I guess. I literally didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Well, that's part of the reason that he moved to Mexico and... Um, he when he when he came back to the United States, he's that of course he's able to be in the United States. It's just that he tried to get a um, a passport and they wouldn't give him one for obvious reasons. So he's like, well, fuck this, I'll just move to Mexico City. So he lived most of his life there. I mean, there's an interview with Babbitt, Milton Babbitt, 
which is actually surpri it's surprisingly interesting. Babbitt's a really interesting I, guy. I actually, I actually really like Babbitt a lot. Well, you know, um, um, so there's some of his music that I like. It just he represents something in in the particular way I don't like how music has sort of changed in the past hundred years, and I'm I you know I have a I have a we'll call it an ambivalent relationship with him as a composer and his ideas mm -hmm. as a you know an academic. But um, yeah, I mean I obviously respect him. I mean like I was literally I. So I've been I've been writing a, an orchestra piece recently that I've been it's under work under the working title weather. It's probably going to be called something like thunderstorm in the end. But okay. I literally I literally realized that I was um take in order to derive rhythms that sounded cool but weren't like me deciding like trying to make something that sounded like rain um that I had to fill up all the 16th note places in a in a measure with 16 options and then mm -hmm. just make a um a, a, a set um, a rhythm set in order so that it would just be kind of random and then by layering it it would sound like rain and it actually worked and then when describing okay. it to some someone else i had to call well i basically i did babbitt serialized rhythm so it's like you know I literally am using techniques that this man generated. I mean, the whole idea of uh, creating like a, an ordered place where you would have the next note in the series would happen in a very specific rhythmic place in the measure. And there are only like a certain number of those things. I mean, it's straight out of his, his, his ideas. Right. So it's like... there's a, I, I did just want to point this out really quickly. So there's a, there's a famous um psychological horror film from the 80s called henry portrait of a serial killer okay and there's an awesome documentary that i just posted we'll put it in the show notes uh but it's called babbitt portrait of a serial composer um oh my goodness it's just yeah oh. they just follow milton babbitt around oh that, and, the, the uh, documentary about babbitt that came that showed up right right, right around when he died yes yes oh yeah it's uh, a great so, documentary yeah. It's it's incredible, and I and well that's the thing is like, um you know what whatever your views are on you know maybe some of his musical philosophical approaches or, uh, uh, you know even the effect he may have had on academic music, um, I really like the guy. Oh sure. Um, he's yeah he's like he's he's just very likable. Well um, you know the the one of the things that Duckworth says at the beginning of his the, he does a little intro about the interview, mm -hmm. and he says for and he says something like, um, for reasons I can't. Uh, I can't. I haven't figured out. Milton and I have always been on good terms, so it's like we've always gotten <laughs> along. And I'm like, okay, oh, that's so sweet. And it, yeah. it must be something have something to do with that they're both from the South. Because oh, sure, Babbitt's from sure. Mississippi. Oh, oh yeah, I didn't realize. So here's that. what it says: For some reason, I don't quite yet understand. I have since our first meeting always been friends with Milton. Perhaps it's because we're both from the South. That's what he mm. says. So then, then there's an, the I've gotten up to the I've gotten through the there's an interview with Lou Harrison, which he okay. just sounds like a, a real he refers to the um, see, he refers to being in the research and development end of music, which I just think is hysterically funny. It's absolutely true of his music, of course, I mean, Harrison's but Harrison wrote some of the most gorgeous music ever. I was listening to some of it recently. Oh, my God. Yes. It's, yeah. Just like the man was willing to write a tune at any time. To do whatever he needed. Mm -hmm. And then there's a picture of him with Copeland and Virgil Thompson. Virgil Thompson helped him. He got a, He started doing writing reviews at the newspaper that Thompson worked for. Mm -hmm. And then I read about Ben. The Ben Johnston interview in this in this thing is just out. It's it's insane. <laughs> ben is like talking about how like well music is destroying the world because we don't take it seriously enough and we we just let it do whatever it's gonna do and it's just like whoa and he's like <laughs> what what is he talking about I, I, mean, I, like, I don't know what that means at all <laughs> right well just like it um sitting and talking with ben johnston on the phone in his 80s almost once a week for a few years almost five years probably mm. um it ta made, made sense to me in the frame of talking to him but I, like outside of other people just like what is this reactionary stuff he's saying and i'm like no it's completely based on the idea that the the fact that we tune music not well or not precisely mm -hmm. makes it so that the musical things that happen are 
are not well aligned and they don't sync with the body well. And therefore, when we do all these things and music can have all these large effects that people have talked about for a long, long time. Like, you know, like, you know, if you go back to Plato, I mean, they talk about, he talks about in the Republic about regulating the kinds of musical modes that you would use in order to help society, because some of them will get you too stirred up and make you do things you shouldn't do socially. And I'm like, we have that effects in our own society. And it's just, he's, he t follows that logic to its uh, conclusion in a certain way. Now, oh, I, I, I mean, it's a really I mean, strange I, interview. This is this is very different. Um, it, well, it it's not, but it, it's a. Uh, they're they're talking about you know music as uh, as sort of the the soundscape phenomenon. Um, but one one thing that I do find interesting is, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of extremist reactionary groups, uh, whether it be. Um, you know, some kind of neo-Nazi movement or some kind of uh, radical jihadist movement, you know, like ISIS or something like that. Uh, if you do talk to people who are, who, you know, who are involved with these groups um, and are now out uh, and, you know, oftentimes, oftentimes activists to try to keep other people from getting in, um, a lot of them talk about how music was, uh, was one of the core ways that they got indoctrinated no sure um, yeah. which i which i always find really fascinating um like there there's a lot of uh prayer chants that are used um with with isis uh like basically isis recruiters as sort of a spiritual you know place uh for comfort um and then uh you know if you look at uh I can't believe I'm using terms like this, but if you look at like the old school Nazi movement in <laughs> at least the United States, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, God, dude, I I live in a weird place on the internet. You do, um, <laughs> but, uh, but no. If you look at like some of the old school ones, you know, the Nazi punk uh, punk phenomenon uh, was a big way to indoctrinate people. I, I mean, you know, to the point where dead Kennedys had to write a song called Nazi punks fuck off yes, because right. there were so many Nazis showing up to punk shows that they needed an anthem to encourage people to fight them, to get them to leave. Right. Um, uh, but, but, you know, even in the current era with the, with the alt right uh, movement that, you know, that is frighteningly uh, having a, an effect on our culture. Uh, but th there's a genre of music called fash wave and it's literally a what? fascist form of vaporwave. Um, oh my god! Take, really? Yeah. They, yes, they take recordings of Hitler and uh, what's his name? Uh, George. George. Is it George Rockwell? I think. Um, okay. Uh, he's George Rockwell was uh, the, Ameri the American English. fascist, basically, right? Yeah. He he's, he started the American Nazi Party. Um, he was like the official first neo-Nazi. But they'll take samples of you know of those types of people and utilize them in like you know modern internet era electronic dance music um wow and it's oh yeah God. it's just you know that's so that's so, so disgusting I, i'm just oh god i know okay. well and so this being said like you know i i'm i'm personally an anti-censorship person uh right. like to the fullest like really but it, it does bring to question you know it's like it's like it's like you know, why is it that whenever you talk to somebody who's left one of these movements, they do talk about the musical element bringing bringing them into it, uh, or or being almost like a a social or uh, you know like a social barrier that made it easier to break, um, or or a way to communicate messages uh, in a not not through just conversation based uh, form of communication. So. Right. I don't know. Maybe Ben was on to something. <laughs> well, well the, the, I think yeah, it's it's. If you take seriously that music can have a social and political effect and interact and change how people interact with one another in society, then the logical thing to say is, what are the positive effects and what are the negative effects? Right. And can you control and can you make choices? I mean, to, to be an anarchist about it, can you make choices in order to achieve the effect that you're aiming at and to minimize mm -hmm. the negative effects that you can foresee. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the clear ways would, there are clear ways this works, right? It's the reason, you know, you know, you're choosing to not say the N-word. 
mm-hmm. in your music right anymore or right. at all and this in this i mean age, i mean there's it's, a, it's not going to help the people that you attain I, like because you know in the end we we make some form of you've done more of this than me political music mm-hmm. and by I, I mean, by you know in your you, the people you're attempting to help as a leftist are oppressed people who mm-hmm. a large portion of them are black using the n-word in that music is not going to is not going to do something that's going to help them right there's actually uh there's a big movement happening called the the vegan hip-hop movement Mm -hmm. which is um trying to make uh it's trying to take uh socially conscious hip-hop music to the next level uh meaning this run by krs1 or something (laughs) because he's vegan and a conscious hip-hop rapper i mean it's not directly but he's definitely like a godfather of the movement um sure. it, this is more you know this is actually more you know younger folk uh you know under eight under 25 i'd say sure um, yeah. but they're they're actually taking it they're taking a very uh positive and critical look at people like kendrick lamar and lupe fiasco and uh you know, like some some of the just really brilliant musicians out there uh, who are mainstream successful, but still very uh, legitimate to um, the social causes. You know, like uh, well, like I mean, I'm glad you brought up KRS One. Like KRS One still lives in the neighborhood he grew up in. Okay. You know, he's he's still not a millionaire. Um, he's successful musically, but he's you know he's still very much one of the people. Um, and even even somebody like Kendrick who you know, made a soundtrack for a Marvel movie. Like, I, I'd still consider him to be pretty aware of of uh, his social status and, and uh, you know, aware aware of, uh, you know, trying to produce a positive message. Um, it's also actually going towards, like, people like um, Immortal Technique, who, yeah. you know, Immortal Technique's messaging, I think, is spot the fuck on on so, you know, on so many of the subject matters, yet he still uses slurs. Um, right. And and well, and you hear the immortal technique like that, like argument for why. And he's like, well, I'm not speaking to you, you know, white man trying to censor me. Like I'm speaking to a community that speaks this way. And I get that point. But it's just it's very cool to see uh, this vegan hip hop movement. You know, they're all under 25, really. And they're starting to look at these socially conscious rappers um, and being like, OK, the message is out there. Now, do we have to keep saying the N-word or homophobic slurs? Like, do we have to keep doing this? Do we right. have to keep saying, you know, misogynistic terms? Um, even when we're not referring to a woman, you know? Like, right. why do you have to use that, uh, you know, as a derogatory term for somebody who's weak? Um, right, and you know, it's clearly that you and I are people that are slowly learning this ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Rather than something oh, yeah. that's no. like we, we knew much about in, in an over, you know say four talk, years talk ago to either of us talk to either of us in one year and our views will be even more uh, right. uh, uh evolved and, and adapted Let, but let's anyways hope that's it, true <laughs> right right yeah uh, um, from from your from your uh, from your mouth to not god's ears right <laughs> yeah um yeah the, but, but you know so it, it's just you know um like it it is a, a one of one of those parts just to just to look at where um you know, oh yeah, you, well, you there's a eat. change in the culture of even in in mm-hmm. certain parts of hip hop. Yeah, great. Sure. Yeah. Well, no, the yeah. so the to the the one more person I want to mention is there's a sure. there's a really great interview with Pauline Oliveros in here. Oh, badass. Yeah, and um, the funny part is that she apparently taught for a long time at um, for like um, 15 years or so at. Um, uh, university, um, what was it, UCLA or, oh shit, oh. I was looking at, no, um, University of South, uh, no, it's the University of California, San Diego. Okay. And uh, she quit and moved to New York. And, um, and Duckworth, uh, Duckworth asks her why she left. And this is interesting. Um, just think about this. This is, this review, an interview was done in the 80s. Another conservative mm-hmm. time, we'll say. Her reply is, the conservatism of the students was one thing. I watched them over 14 years go from being wide open to coming down to a very narrow track. And I began to feel like an aging hippie who had all these funny things to do and say to students who didn't want to hear about it. They wanted to learn how to earn a living. They expected me to provide them with skills and tools and, quote, let's not have any of this nonsense about creativity, unquote. So I thought... 
I don't belong here anymore. And I felt the pressure and the struggle of the university in general, the struggle for funding and resources. An enormous amount of time is spent recruiting new faculty and sitting on committees to govern this bureaucracy. I felt that the academic bureaucracy was beginning to consume too much time. I wanted the energy that I have in this part of my life to go into composing and performing. So I came to New York because there are more resources here and people are closer together. It's possible to relate to some wonderful performers more quickly. So what I'm just noticing is that the thing that's the big problem about being in a university right now is literally the thing she said. Like, it's just only gotten worse. Mm-hmm. And she got out for this reason. That it's like the wow. bureaucracy has gotten huge. And that because of the economic situation of the students, I'm not going to plant it on the students getting, quote, more conservative, which may have actually, which is probably the case. But it's that they are coming in and having to spend money rather than going for free. And therefore, they have economic expectations of their time in the university rather than just, I don't know, exploring sound. Right. In the way that Pauline Oliveros is like one of the top five masters of. Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, it it just anyway, it was just the the other part (laughs) is that she talks about like, you know, that she doesn't go to um, she doesn't spend much time in in, in upper, upper Manhattan at the time when they used to have a distinction between uptown and downtown music. And she says, well. And her, her basic the thing is, well, well you know, I, I go up there for certain things, but I don't really go to concerts much. I guess I should go to more of them. But it's really nice when I go to, you know, in my from my apartment in downtown. I You know, I just, I walk over to Phil Nubbock's place where he has concerts, and I just li- get to sit and listen to music. And then we there's nice camaraderie afterwards, and then I can walk home. It's very nice. Wow. And it's just sort of like, <laughs> it's just sort of like, I'm just sitting there thinking, I mean, you can literally just walk to Phil Niblock's house and go listen to somebody play drones for a couple of hours. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> but, well, you know, that reminds me, Dorian, I went to a concert on Sunday. So the there's a guy. The, so the, the guy who now is the head of the performing arts department at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which, by the way, if anybody has never been to the Cleveland Museum of Art before, you have to go because it's fucking free and you can walk in and just see Picasso and um, and Monet right on the wall in front of you. They don't like stop you. You just go in. It's free forever. It's amazing. Anyway, the guy who runs the performing arts department, Tom Welsh, he does an amazing job curating some of these concerts. And he brought in a woman from, um, she's now, she's Canadian, but she's actually getting an ethno degree at UCLA. Her name is Sarah De- Davachi, D-A-V-A-C-H-I. Okay. And she apparently got a, um, an, a master's degree in electronic music from Mills College. And so she's been making for a few years as a composer and as a performer this really um, captivating and beautiful, very simple, sort of slow, gorgeous music. It's got, it's, you know, she, she, she sat and played a keyboard and she played some ostinatos every once in a while, but most of it was just holding out a drone and then mic- fiddling with dials. So it's just like slow timbral change and and then uh, involving loop pedals to sort of create a larger surface. But it was just gorgeous yeah. for an hour. And it was just like, and I was sitting there going, oh man, something to calm down to. It's been so long. Right. <laughs> so it was fantastic. on that's- that same kind of musical philosophy, but totally opposite as far as calming down. Um, this just sparked a memory. Uh, there was a conversation I had once with uh, with uh, uh, an actress, actually, like a performance art professor. We were just talking about, you know, experimental uh, music making and, uh, and improvisation specifically. And, you know, this was when I was in a particularly large Sun Ra phase. Mm-hmm. And, and, oh yeah, sure. And just describing his music, it was like, no, there's one track where he just puts his hand down on a synthesizer and just doesn't lift his hand for like five minutes. Right. Yeah. Sure. Right. <laughs> and right. her response was, "Why? <laughs> I don't well, know. I don't have. I don't have that answer. But it's well, awesome. It has to do. Well, well when it's Sun Rod, it has to do something with the cosmos." Right, has and to do being with the from another planet, 
and right. uh, I, uh, I just, so so if anybody if you ever describe music to someone and they go why it's generally a good time to just wrap up that conversation very kindly and walk away <laughs> just cuz it was just i mean cuz dorian if you told if you told me that he put his hand down on the on the synthesizer and held it there for 5 minutes i would have been is there a recording of that <laughs> Well, and, and the answer is is yes. I just don't know where that recording is. It was one right. of the live uh, YouTube videos. That, oh, you know, sweet! Look, look for Sun Ra, dude. Well, and then, um, then then he'll turn around and play a blues. You know, just right. straight on <laughs> just the sickest motherfucking blues ever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. dude. Um, there was uh, there's a, a buddy. Um, I'd love to have on on this podcast coming up uh, sometime. Um, his name's Ben Bath. He's uh, he's doing the musical. Um, coordinating for the democratic socialists of america chorus uh sing okay. in solidarity yeah. and <laughs> he'll have to tell the story but um just just to give an overlay is uh i guess um i don't know if it was somebody he knew or a story he had read but something had come up where uh this per you know a person had learned about sun ra by description um, well, well, not Sun Ra, but the the current um, the current orchestra that's still going on. Sure. Um, and it was either they went to a concert or they had like hired something. They had done something with the orchestra, not knowing what they were getting into. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> All of a sudden, this orchestra, you know, called the orchestra of like thirty people wearing these giant space Egyptian costumes mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, they just started chanting for like like an hour before they got to any of the <laughs> instrumental stuff. <laughs> I'll, 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 like, I'm just setting this up just so that we remember right. when Ben comes on this because I think he'd be a good guy to talk to. But, uh, sure. but it's just like I would love to... <laughs> to think like oh there's a jazz band you know some some person who has no idea about yeah, right. you know the depth right. of music right. and how far it can go <laughs> and getting right. exposed to the Sun Ra Orchestra <laughs> like right. thinking they were gonna be a swing band <laughs> well just just imagine just imagine being like a guy booking a jazz club in the 1950s or the 60s and uh, you know you're used to dealing with you know Dave Brubeck style guys Mm -hmm. And then it's like, hey, uh, hey um, well, uh, who's coming in? Um, well, it's this guy named Ornette Coleman. What's that going to sound like? Oh, no, well, you'll see. You'll see. Right, I mean, right. Just the, just the kind of like the experience of that. That's the thing that would have been amazing to be able to see, Dorian, because mm. we're too young to really have this experience. It's just of being one of the people to show up at a jazz club and Ornette Coleman and Charlie Hayden and all them guys are like, they just happen to be the band that night. Right. Right. And you experience that for the first time. Right. I mean, just like, Oh my like, God. It, just, Don yeah, Cherry right. I mean, Ornette like Coleman. as if you, that, that music didn't yeah. exist. And then you heard it for the first time. What would that right. be like? Right. We just don't know. Well, you know, I, I do uh, have not quite the, that experience. Um, but the, you know there there was uh so I, i've actually been kind of digging into um the early 90s well, sorry the the um early 2000s late 90s uh like metalcore and mathcore music oh um, wow okay you know just ha haven't listened to this stuff in a while uh That's some intense music it, it, well specifically was listening to jane doe uh by the band converge which if y'all have not listened to that album Go fucking listen to it right now. Um, first off, one of the things about this album that blew my mind. Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, first off, the music is just absolutely incredible. Um, but here, let me let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, Jane Doe Converge. Um, you know, I'm looking at a Wikipedia article about it. Yeah. So. Um, so just just on a psychological element, one of, one of my favorite things in here, it talks about the, uh, uh, let's see, gold is what it, okay, yeah, so, um, musical style and theme. The themes found in Jane Doe's liner notes differ from the lyrics on the recorded tracks. One example what? of this is the, yes, dude, check this out. One example of this is the liner notes for the opening track, Concubine, state that the lyrics are, for I felt the greatest of winters coming, 
and I saw you as seasons shifting from blue to gray. That's where the coldest of these days await me, and distance lays her heavy head beside me. There I'll stay gold, forever gold. However, when listening to the song, uh, the, the lyrics are just repeating, You'll stay gold, I'll stay gold. Repeated over and over again. <laughs> and dude, this guy's this guy's voice is so fucking incredible. Like it's it's I, the reason I was digging into them again was I remember the first time hearing them, they scared me. Like it wow, was one okay. of those like what am like yeah. I'm really uncomfortable listening to this, but I am not uncomfortable enough to like stop it. Um but yeah, so, so check this out. It says, on this topic, Scott Butterworth of Noisy said, it's something confusing in congruity, but at the same time, it's eerily reminiscent of a moment most of us have experienced. If you've ever planned an elegant, well-reasoned speech in your head, only to feel too overwhelmed, too hurt, too emotional to spit it out when the time came, you understand the brilliant trick that Bannon is pulling here. So, dude, there are literally lyrics written in the liner notes that are never said in the songs. Wow, that's a, it's, that's that's something it's inc- I never occurred, to th- never thought of doing something like that. Dude, it made it like the concept of making the liner notes a piece of the art. Like, oh, sure, you write. It's like if there, it's actually a book of poems. It's sure. not lyrics to the songs. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, so it's like they're they're just part of the the album art rather than right rather than like you know the, here's our. Can you imagine if the, if you imagine in the book it just said, uh, "You stay gold, I'll stay gold." You just I'll stay gold just the number of times it happened, like right, in the liner, right. just like liner. times twenty six or something. <laughs> Like if it was on Genius or something, you know, time to right. You know. right. You know what? Actually, let's check this out. Let's see what Genius, uh, if they have Converge lyrics. Um, probably if it's so bad, you know, it's from the 2001, so it's probably yeah. been long enough. Yeah, Converge, Concubine, lyric. Okay, let's see what they have. Uh, Here, can you share that link in the in the Google oh, Doc yeah, yeah. so I can see it? So so they have the... Uh, they the, um, Genius has the... Um, the lyrical content uh, of the liner notes, okay. not, not the recorded lyrics. Well, but okay. then, the, dude, the thing that gets even deeper is I checked the track out um, of like a live recording. He improvises the lyrics even in the live setting. Um, oh, really? It's just oh yeah, it, dude. It's dope as fuck. Like it's really dope as fuck. Um, and the other the other element. Um, that that is so cool about this band is is just um just their straight up musicianship like it's uh one of the reasons i was digging into them was because uh uh there, there's a project coming up with um with elliot wallace my brother uh you know and he's going to be playing drum set and you know like there's something about these um these like grindcore and metalcore bands that almost gets taken out during uh, music school training mm-hmm. um you know it's like it's like on a technical level these you know these musicians are unbelievable but there's also like a raw sloppiness to it that yeah. um that you know kind of disappears a little bit and I, i'm not saying like uh, that's a hundred percent like a fact or anything because there are plenty of musicians who have formal training uh that are just absolutely astounding and completely raw and all of that and, and i think you understand this like yeah but but all this being said was uh, I was just re-listening to this music um, to send to Elliot just to be like, hey, how can you play like this? <laughs> how can you sure. make it sound like you're losing control like the entire album, but you never lose control once? <laughs> um Oh yeah, so so the whole point of all of this was, even though I, I don't think this is the same exact experience of what it would be like seeing, uh, you know, the Ornette Coleman Quartet for the first time, mm-hmm. um, but I do remember the experience of a friend of mine putting this album on, uh, and just being like, what the fuck am I listening to? Right, <laughs> like, right. Like, well. and it was like, it was scary and frightening, but it was like, it was like, this is, this is really good, scary and frightening. Um, well, it's the, well, Dorian, I, you know, I have experiences of, of 
just like my 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 usual experiences are listening to music that's so amazing that my immediate my immediate reaction is anger that no one had shown it to me before <laughs> like why the fuck did no one tell me about this <laughs> right, right. right so the like ornate when ornate coleman died like mm-hmm. i was like on twitter at the time which you can't find my twitter account because i deleted it after being on there for like 10 years but i was following quest love at the time and Questlove shared the, the what it's that American orchestral oh, uh, album um, tribute to America, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah, w- but, yes, by that Coleman. One. Yeah, well, let me look it up. But yeah, it's... I I literally just turned it on in, in my house because I was at home that morning, and I it literally just started, and I was standing there for almost the entire time, and I I, I remember bodily screaming with, "What the fuck is this? This is amazing!" Right. Like, over and over again i just like i i just i couldn't believe that something like um yeah skies of america yeah that that's one. it yeah um we should and, link oh, that shit that's amazing i mean yeah. just it was basically like carl ruggles with with improvising musicians on the top of it mm-hmm. sometimes from from what i remember uh the trio doesn't even really come in for like yeah, it's like ten minutes. It's, yeah, it's, it's like, a long wait. So it's just it's just amazing, dissonant counterpoint orchestral music for a, a good long chunk of it. Right. And it's just like, well, holy fucking shit! Well, you know, he wanted to be a composer, right? Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I, and and the fucking racism of our society made it so he had to become the one of the best jazz musicians ever. So. Right. <laughs> But this oh, dude, is this I is mean, the this is the this is the album that shows what kind of composer he could have been had be had he been allowed into the firmament. Mm-hmm. There, there's uh, you know, it, it's it's not only um the the racist uh, racist element with Coleman, um, but it's it's also the classist uh, element. Right. Um, you know, like there there is there he got shit on, and I mean, still gets shit on today, uh, for his use of a plastic saxophone. Oh sure, yeah. Um, you know, and it's one it's one of those things where it's like it's like motherfuckers like the dude didn't know like what a standard saxophone was. He shined shoes for three years to be able to afford an instrument because he wanted to play. It took him three years to get an instrument and he got the cheapest one he could get, which was plastic. And right. you know, and it's I don't know, it's just uh fucking fucking classist motherfuckers. Right. right. Uh, well Yeah. Yeah. Though it's just it's you know, anyway. Anyway, so cool. experimental music in all sorts of ways for a half an hour. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, just uh, I, I, I'm not gonna listen to this right now, but I'm I'm putting it in the show notes just so we have it. Uh, sure. Uh, there is a video that popped up while looking for the Ornette Coleman Skies of America. It's yeah. Cecil Taylor playing at Ornette Coleman's memorial. Whoa. Um, I, be- I believe Cecil was in his in his 90s at this point in time. Right. Actually, Michael Eaton was there. Uh, right, he told. I saw yeah. this live, um, so yeah, I, I've not. Okay, well, I didn't know there was video of that. I would have. Nope, me neither. Okay, well, well <laughs> then we'll have to watch that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I'm sure that's amazing. <clears throat> that could actually maybe be our playout music for this well, episode. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> there right, are certain right. kinds of copyright breaking we can do. Let's not do that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um. Well, I'm cool. more than happy to have you read the poem, though. That's fine. I'll oh. do that at the end, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Totally. So, so you wanted to talk about this, um, this crazy fucking baby eater thing meme? Oh my god! All right. So, for those of you that are not caught up, which is this... me, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in this goddamn Alexandra Ocasio Cortez eat the babies thing. I'm just going to read from knowyourmeme.com. Uh, so the overview Eat the babies, AOC hoax, refers to an incident that occurred during a speech delivered by Alexandria Ocasio Cortez at a town hall meeting in early October 2019. And just to point out, the day of this recording is October 8th. So this was like a couple of days ago. Um, So, uh, in which a woman loudly interrupted to advocate eating babies to combat climate change. Following Uh. the incident, the Twitter account of the fringe political extremist organization, Lyndon LaRouche Pack, took credit for the stunt, referring to it as a troll. So they they did that. Um, So the background. 
On October 3rd, 2019, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez held a town hall meeting in Queens, New York. During a Q&A session at the end of the meeting, a woman spoke to Ocasio-Cortez and loudly advocated that climate activists eat the babies. Uh, footage of the moment was captured by C-SPAN, which is shown below. We can I'll put a link in the show notes for this as well. So this is the quote of what this woman says. Um, <clears throat> I am so happy that you are really supporting a Green New Deal, but it's not enough. Even if we were to bomb Russia, we still have too many people, too much pollution, so we have to get rid of the babies. That's a big problem. Just stopping having babies is not enough. We need to eat the babies. I think your next campaign slogan has to be this. We have to start eating babies. Ocasio-Cortez pivoted away from the eat the babies portion of the woman's question and said there was still hope to reverse climate change and that looking for solutions was important. Dude, this makes me ill, actually, on a lot of levels. Well, the thing um, is, it's, it's not really even that original. No! No! I mean, it's just like, because any, anybody that's taken some sort of pol- politics class or some sort of... St- They've they've heard about Jonathan Swift's a modest proposal, which is basically some you know um, an ironic thing, an erotic uh, essay he wrote anonymously, I believe at first. That's just about well, let's just let's just eat babies. And it's like mm. and clearly the intent of the thing is to not eat babies. It's to make right. other people's arguments look stupid. Right. 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 So, but now, but, now, now they've got. Now we live in this world where there are a bunch of people who think that AOC is is pro baby eating because of this. Yeah. Well, so the reason the reason I should tell everybody why this is uh, why I am having a visceral reaction. Like, if um, so, I do a lot of internet shit where I hang out on right wing sites. Like, I, I'm in a lot of right wing Facebook groups. I'm a lot of right wing Reddit pages. Uh, even a couple of accounts on, you know, some, some deep web right wing like forums. And the idea, uh, is, you know, partially, uh, to, um, just see what they're thinking about because, you know, it's like the Sun Tzu, uh, you know, concept of, of know your enemy. And, um, you know, the, these people I do see as, as, uh, basically philosophically the, the exact opposite of, of where I stand on, on a lot of views. Uh, and so I, I want to know where, you know, why they think they think the way they do. And what's been so frightening over the last couple of days, I actually didn't find out about this eat the babies thing from from my normal media sources. Uh, it was actually from memes in right wing groups oh, and seeing wow. how, uh, you know, just the comments were just like, oh, my God, did you see she didn't. Uh, and she as an AOC didn't didn't respond by saying no don't eat babies do you think maybe she supports eating babies and it so you know so like when you watch the video it's like it's like have you ever been to New York City there are people that do this stuff on on the street on the subway on a regular basis you don't yep. know what kind of violent reaction they could have and what AOC did was she she de-escalated it she didn't argue with this seemingly mentally ill woman um and the reason why this is such a brilliant right-wing troll move is that this was one incident that was caught on tape uh you know caught on film and it's now infiltrating itself into the meme culture and a year from now people are going to associate uh the climate change movement with baby eating and most people will see it as fake but enough people will either think it's real or at least it indicates that there's some kind of you know malicious undertone to to the climate change movement. Well, it's um, you know, it's it's the same kind of sh- it's just another extreme version of the same thing when they were arguing about how apparently the uh, the climate change proposal in Congress was going to somehow uh, eliminate planes and cows. Right. It's like which is of course ludicrous. Mm-hmm. And well, this, this and, is just and, a more extreme element. This is getting closer to Pizzagate level of shit. Right. Well, and, and the other thing is, um, you know, if you do check out the LaRouche pack, and by the way, we're not going to link that in the show notes. Cause, nope. Um, yeah, you can do that shit on your own. Um, uh, but if you do check out their website, 
uh, they they really are pu- pumping a lot of propaganda out there that uh, climate change is actually uh, climate change activism is actually some form of of uh, you know genocidal um, you know it's some form of like way to justify killing people which it is not it's literally not uh, right and there's nobody definitely AOC is not a person who would advocate for anything like that right. Jesus. Like, oh, well, the... oh, keep Go going, ahead. keep going. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I did just want to read through a little bit more of this just to... Because, of course, um, you know, this isn't just, uh, you know, on the Reddit pages that um, that this is getting brought up, but um, the President of the United States is tweeting about it. Um, oh, there you at, go. At, as if AOC... It, Oh my god. Okay, so yeah, let's let's get through this. So <clears throat> footage of the question began to spread shortly after the event. Some conservative Twitter users mocked Ocasio Cortez for not condemning the woman's proposal. Twitter user user Dooney Diesel, I don't know who that is, wrote How hard is it to say no, we are not going to eat babies? Uh yeah, and so oh, and that's shown below to the left. Uh, and then Donald Trump Jr. wrote that the woman seemed like a normal AOC supporter to me. Wait, who said <sighs> that? Donald Trump Jr. Oh, about yeah, this woman, the the most the most stable of geniuses. Yes, yes. Uh, um, Ocasio Jr. Cortez later tweeted about the moment, saying she felt the woman was in crisis and that. It's not okay that the right wing is mocking her and potentially make her condition or, or crisis worse. Um, President Trump tweeted, AOC is a whack job. Some Twitter users praised the congresswoman for the way she handled the situation. Congressman Mike Schlossberg said, wrote, And this is how you decently treat someone who is in the middle of a breakdown and does so publicly. Thank you. Um... Oh, I think uh, I just lost David. Hold on. I'm hitting, I'm calling him back really quickly. All right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, I'm here. Yep, cool. All right, yeah. Uh, Basically, somebody just called me on my phone, and I tried to hang up on them, and I hung up on everybody. Um, But, yeah, but I I still recorded into the microphone, so all of this is cut up. Um, so there you go. Anyways, so just welcome to the joys of us us doing this. You get to listen to all of that. Um, later, members of the LaRouche movement claimed responsibility for the stunt, referring to it as a troll. They claimed it was satire akin to Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Yeah, so you called that one, David. Um, uh-huh. The group has been attempting to troll environmental activists by spreading an eat the children message. Eat the children message? Oh my Dude, god. The, what? the thing that pisses me off about this like i actually really enjoy uh anti-evolutionary like conspiracy theorists like i i, I think i think they're funny you, the you, thing you that... enjoy them aesthetically you should say yes yes i i not, I think... not that because you think they're right no, no, no I, <laughs> I i very much believe in in evolution uh and the right. theory of evolution um but the thing that is so disturbing about all of this shit is climate change is an actual existential threat to not just us, but to our grandchildrens, to all the plants, all the animals on this planet. It, mm-hmm. And I, it's just, ugh. It's, it's like, um, you know, the, the climate change deniers of today or the evolution deniers of, of yesteryear, I guess. Um, well, considering the evolution deniers haven't really gone much of anywhere. Although they, right, I, right. I guess they're smaller. There are fewer of them. Yeah. Well, it, it's just... It, it's a dumb position to have, but it's not, it's not an existential threat. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, yeah yes, so you're right. Historian Matthew Sweet has written a book about conspiracy movements of the late 60s that included research on LaRouche, told the Washington Post, they've been doing this since the 70s. The tactic is you go to a political meeting and you create a disturbance that disrupts the meeting, and more importantly, that creates a kind of chaos. After the LaRouche group claimed responsibility, uh, ability, Ocasio-Cortez wrote, doesn't rule out potential mental issue, DRS do that, but good to know that they were not in crisis. Earlier this year, I was stalked 
and was nearly hurt by a disturbed person. I don't take chances and immediately try to de-escalate. So, that's what you missed this week, David. Uh, oh, by not... <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm so, um, I'm so glad you filled me in. Um, Jesus, yeah. what a mess. Um, I know. So, it's, that's the thing, is that there's so many fucking bad actors here. I'm like, what, 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 what is the LaRouche movement's problem with AOC and climate change? Like, advocating for doing something about climate change. What is their problem? I don't know. I mean, I, like, fuck these people. I just, I know. I'm really just tired. Uh, I'm just so tired of this crap that we have to deal with of these people that are just. I don't. It, there's no. I've been trying to imagine for a long time what are the reasons to deny climate change, and I, you know, you've done more research into this than I have because, like, you know, you 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 go into the places where these people are. I, I, I still just, don't really know the reasons other than right. that. Uh, other than that, some business people make money. Um, yeah, well, just you know, it's like it's basically, well, Exxon wants to be still really big and. Rather than, you know, do enough research and development and other forms of energy to be the big, the big fish in the small pond of renewables, mm -hmm. they're going to strip all of the money possible out of fossil fuels and kill us all in the process in the name of whatever money they think they might, they think they might get out of it. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I'm just, it, the thing I think, Dorian, in the end is that you and I are so unmoved by money as a goal. <laughs> what do you mean, avant-garde <laughs> performance composer? <laughs> yeah, just like that. that it, there, there's a certain level at which we don't really understand yeah. people who choose to make money their main goal in life. Well, so... Right? Um, so before this happened, uh, this AOC incident happened, um, I actually, uh, I, I've sort of been moving away, uh, not, not moving away from, but I feel like I've learned everything I need to know about fascists, uh, at least at this point in my life, uh, you know, for the last, last three years, really, of kind of regularly being around um, fascists on the internet, just, just to see what they're all about, and I've actually been kind of moving towards uh, the libertarian right, uh, you know, the, the economic conservatives, and just checking these groups out, and I actually find them almost more infuriating than fascists. Um, oh, really? Why? Well, let, 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 like, this is, you know, I, I'm, this is a new project as of, like, the last, like, week and a half. Um, oh, okay, so it's, like, so, fresh yeah, on it, right? Okay. Yeah, so, like, so like you know, don't don't say, don't say take this stuff as, like, you know, final conclusions at all. Uh, okay, I'm so definitely yeah, going to trip up. You're, yeah. you're early in data collection, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely going to trip up, you know, on some of the, some of the, the, the statements. But anyways, um, fascists are... You know, generally people with severe trauma um, who have been given an explanation on why their lives suck. It's a yeah. horrible explanation. Right. It, you know, it's conspiratorial uh, in, in, in thinking. Um, right. But it's got almost like an easier to understand psychological explanation. Right. It's clear. It's straightforward in its logic. I mean, it's yeah. batshit crazy, mm -hmm. but if you can't see how the mechanisms of power work, it's totally believable because all of that stuff is opaque to you anyway. Right, right. Well, and, and in fact, like, uh, you know, one thing that, that I would say in defense of not fascism, but in people who become indoctrinated by fascism, uh, it's like their diagnosis is accurate. They accurately see problems of, of the culture. You know, right. uh, they accurately see systemic problems. Their conclusion is horrifyingly wrong. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it, but it's like, I will give them, it's like, it's like, yeah, like you are seeing things like, and, and I'll give you that. Like, so anyways, the, the right wing libertarians, um, the, man, it's, it's so strange because it's a group of people that 
you know, seemingly prides themselves on facts and logic and rational thinking. Yes, right. And it is just so far the most reactionary, emotional group I've ever come across on the internet. And I will literally put out, uh, you know, studies. I'll pu- I'll post. Um, yeah, no. You know, just like like anecdotal evidence. Uh, you know, like one of one of my favorites is people are like, uh, you know, where like what what are you? You sound like a communist, and it's like I mean to a degree, sure, but you know, it's like I'm really a libertarian socialist. Like if if you need to identify me, and they're like, nope, libertarian socialism's not real. It's like, what do you mean it's not real? Like, you can say you don't agree with it. That's that's fine. We can argue about this. But what do you mean it's not real? And this isn't, you know, an argument I've been getting from one or two people. It's been pretty oh, it's, consistent. It's the whole thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, all of them say it, yeah. Well, and so then I bring up the Zapatista movement, or I bring up, uh, you know, Rojava, which... Ugh, sorry, that's all. It's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, like, that's that's a group that's literally in the news regularly right now. That, that they're the libertarian socialist model, or, or there's even um, there's even a company, a worker co-op, uh, the Mondragon in Spain. It's yeah. the eleventh right. largest economy, uh, you know, at least right now in Spain. That that follows the libertarian socialist model, and so I'll bring you know I'll bring I'll I'll show like you know, articles about the, those groups, or I'll bring up anecdotal evidence of things, or I'll show, you know, data on, like, you know, the amount of impact that Rojava has had fighting against ISIS right now. And the people just tell me, they're like, nope, fake. It's all fake. You're lying. You're making this up. And yeah, it's just well, like, it, and well, and, then, and so then I'll go, okay, like, you know, where, where's your sources? Like, I'm interested, like, show me, you know, because, like, the whole the whole approach to, to debating these kinds of people, it's like, you know, it, it's actually a very Marxian, uh, like, debate style where you meet the person where they're at. It's like, okay, right. I'm not going to, like, fight you. It's like, I'm going to, like, look at you as, you know, you're here, and so show me what you've got, and I will take you seriously. <laughs> Whether I think you're serious or not, you know, like, uh, you're, you know, or... Like, like, it's like, I'll take you at your level and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, and it has had, just, just to point all of this out, it has actually had some positive impact um, on a few individual fascists that I've, you know, been in communication with over a period of time where they do start to go, hmm, didn't really think of it that way. Or, or like, really? Like, like, I never thought about it as like a working class issue before. Um, you know, yeah. uh, but but so anyways, uh, back to the uh, the right wing libertarians. Um, I ask for evidence, and they don't give it. And in well, fact, they, there, there there was one ahead. person who told me, "I'm not spoon feeding it to you. You have to figure it out for yourself." And I said, "But I just gave you like 20 articles to read, and I want you know. It's like I obviously have my own ideology, and I'm asking your assistance to guide me." And this person was just like, "Nope." It's not true. Like I, like I, you need to figure it out. I'm not going to help you, which is such a fucking cop out. <laughs> right. Well, Dorian, can I can I give my yep? Can I give my guess as to why the it's more frustrating to talk to the right wing libertarians than the fascists? Hmm. It's because the, uh, well, uh, to to paraphrase uh, Dave Chappelle, it's like uh, when. It's when Western philosophy, rationalism goes wrong. Wow. So if you take the whole, the whole way of arguing that Socrates and Plato do, and you just funnel it through the history of philosophy through the 19th century, and you just make logic the only basis by which anything is true or false, not evidence, not anthropology, or sociology, or any of the ways we use to study hum- humans, or even mm-hmm. psychology, even they rely on thought experiments, which is completely out of philosophy. And well, if I think of it this way, then it's true. And since the words I mean when I say those words mean something else, it means the thing you're talking about is fake because it doesn't fit my possible thought experiments that I can think of. And your evidence is a priori, before, before the fact, wrong. You know, it's like, 
It doesn't matter what evidence you bring because my thoughts are true. That's the thing they're coming from. Yeah. Which is why Sam Cedar basically has to back them into a corner by talking them about slavery to make them look like idiots. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, based upon their ideology, slavery's okay as long as you willingly volunteer for it. As long as there's, you can do slavery with no coercion. And, of course, Sam Cedar's like, but what? when are we going to ever have no co coercion? <laughs> it's like, you know... I don't know if he's actually said that specifically, but you know he makes he makes that, them look yeah. like fools, right? Yeah. So I don't. I, I might imagine that it'll require a different tactic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it it is very interesting. Um, just uh, just you know d digging into um, like so one of the, one of the things that that was so interesting um, in debate tactic uh, with. with with fascists is you know like I, I think we had mentioned it last week but there's the strong man or steel man arguing where instead of yeah. side swiping you try to come at the person from their belief system so right. that you get you explain their belief system in a satisfying way that they're happy with um which by the way rarely happens uh, in the reverse like i i get told a lot about my ideology without <laughs> ever any but like without somebody who's opposing it um getting it right ever uh but yeah well, it's because um, she goes to show you how nobody actually gives a shit what you think yeah of course of, <laughs> course, mean, just like, of course well it's just it's just like leftists don't matter because they don't have any money right-wing people matter because they have money yeah so but, they um, get they get to they get to shit on you all they want because you know they can afford to buy groceries tomorrow right well, so, like, the thing is, like, with Steelman arguing with fascists, it's almost, uh, you know, you you can find those strange uh, common ground areas. Like, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you are getting fucked over by rich people. Like, yes, uh, you know, like, um, you know, economic disparity is, like, a major problem in your own life. Like, yes, like, healthcare needs to be an open open thing. It's, you know, and, and so, like, the difficulty with fighting with that group is sort of figuring, you know, basically uh, getting them to come to the conclusion that their perceived enemy is the wrong enemy. Um, right. And so, uh, anyways, like, that's the approach uh, I was basically using for the libertarian right, where it's like, hey, listen, like, I'm a free speech absolutist. Like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm all about the... the <laughs> God, dude, saying this out loud, it's really, really gross. It's way easier to type. But um, it's like, I'm all about the marketplace of ideas. Uh, you know, yeah. and I'm like, the best idea oh. will... Yeah, <laughs> you can vomit in your mouth. <laughs> you're, 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 it's like you're quoting Dave Rubin at me. It's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> no. no, it's like, dude, <laughs> the thing is, I actually agree with... It's the all about ideas, man. I actually agree to like some degree about the marketplace of ideas, but it's been exploited so badly by these like Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro types. Um, but but so anyways, it's like I, you know trying to find the common ground. It's like all right, you know I, I do agree. Uh, like you know free free speech is a, is an uh, is a necessity, and and you know like anti censorship, and you know the best idea can win, and they just won't take that like <laughs> they won't take that bait almost so it's a it's yeah. a new project learning how to debate with right-wing libertarians um oh, also good. well that that'll be another three years of your life oh, yeah, yeah well the other the other thing is uh the reason they're also a little more frustrating is um they're they're, they're threats they don't threaten you <laughs> Like fascists, like will send you death threats, and it's like okay, like like, like that that went south. Wow. Like all right, like libertarian socialists, like or no, sorry, uh, uh, right wing libertarians tend to be, um, you know, pretty pretty pacifist in concept uh, to violence. Of course, they they have such an unrealistic view of violence because these are all people who you know, tend to claim that they support the American Revolution, which was a fucking war. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> which was a war from an insurgent movement. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. <sighs> but, yeah. 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 Anyways, okay. uh, we well, are I now... Think, I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're it's time to wrap hour. up. 
Did you want to say anything before we conclude, David? Uh, and I was going to read the poem, which I think perfectly ties all of this together. Uh, um, uh, do you want to do the? Do you want us to wrap up after or before the poem? Oh, uh, let's finish with the poem. So let's wrap up. Okay. So uh, yeah. So, so you've been listening to Tristeropod. I'm David Coma. Dorian's Dorian Wallace. Yeah, we're composers. Thanks yeah. for listening to this. Um, um, you'll find us on the internet wherever you found this. <laughs> so, so uh, we'll talk to you next time. Untitled Anarchist Poem by John Cage. We don't need government. We need utilities. Air, water, energy, travel and communication means, food and shelter. We have no need for imaginary mountain ranges between separate nations. We can make tunnels through the real ones. Nor do we have any need for the continuing division of people into those who have what they need and those who don't. Both Fuller and Marshall McLuhan knew, furthermore, that work is now obsolete. We have invented machines to do it for us. Now that we have no need to do anything, what shall we do? Looking at Fuller's geodesic world map, we see that the Earth is a single island, Oahu. We must give all the people all they need to live, in any way they wish. Our present laws protect the rich from the poor. If there are to be laws, we need ones that begin with the acceptance of poverty as a way of life. We must make the world safe for poverty without dependence on government. This is Tristeropod. Have a good one.